Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to cover chronic kidney disease and its management and primary care. We're going to cover the most salient bits to your clinical practice and exam preparation. Let's start by the most common causes, which by far are diabetes and hypertension. Other common causes include chronic glomerulonephritis, polycystic kidney disease, and pyelonephritis. It's also worth considering the classification of chronic kidney disease and its staging, and it's generally done by GFR, or the glomerular filtration rate. Stage 1 is defined as the GFR is greater than 90, and a stage 2 is the GFR greater than 60 but less than 90, but it's worth noting that the definition of CKD in stage 1 and 2, the user needs or proteinuria levels, need to be abnormal. Stage 3a, however, is a GFR between 45 and 59 and can be diagnosed purely on the GFR level on the blood. Stage 3b is a GFR between 30 and 44. Stage 4 is classified as severe, is a GFR of less than 30. And a stage 5 is when it's less than 15, and this is when renal replacement therapy, be it dialysis or transplants, are actually considered. It's worth remembering that pregnancy, extremes of muscle mass, and red meat all affect GFR levels which are classically measured by calculations considering the creatinine, age, gender and ethnicity of the patient. Proteinuria helps quantify and classify the severity of CKD. Nowadays proteinuria is assessed by the albumin creatinine ratio or the ACR and this can be used as it can be taken as a snapshot usually as a first pass of urine in the morning. Anything less than 3 is considered A1, anything between 3 and 30 is A2, and anything above 30 is A3. This is important because it helps classify the severity of CKD in terms of protein loss with nephrologists needing to know a patient in the following circumstances. An ACR above 70 in a patient that's not diabetic, or an ACR above 30 with hematuria in the absence of infection. Using both the GFR and ACR combined, you get GFR classification as well as ACR classification. This together helps quantify how many times a year a patient needs their renal function being checked. Now we've covered the etiology and the classification of CKD, we can look at some of the more things we expect to look out for and manage as general practitioners, which are common exam questions. First up, hypertension in CKD. ACE inhibitors are usually first line in CKD, particularly in diabetics, as they are seen to be renoprotective. They do, however, increase the GFR and creatinine simply because it works by reducing the glomerular filtration pressure. I just recommend that we can expect and accept a drop in GFR by 25% and a rise in creatinine up to 30%. Moving on to renal bone disease. Going back to medical physiology, we need to remind ourselves the role of the kidney in bone profile management. Typically, 1-alpha-hydroxylase is the enzyme that converts inactive vitamin D to activated vitamin D in the kidney. Therefore, in CKD, we get low vitamin D. Additionally, the kidney has an important role in phosphate excretion, thus poor renal function means a rising phosphate. Hence, in turn, there's a total raised phosphate, a low vitamin D, which in turn causes a low calcium, the latter of which we typically see in secondary hyperparathyroidism. So why is this relevant? Well, CKD patients, we need to make sure that we give advice about a low phosphate diet, and also phosphate binders to keep the phosphate levels in check. Examples of phosphate binders include calcium carbonate or cervalimer. To correct the low vitamin D, calcitriol or alpha-calcidol are usually given, which help boost the calcium supplies as well as help suppress the PTH. Finally, anemia in CKD. The kidneys play a massive role in regulating haemoglobin levels. Hence, when they're not working, the following occurs. There's a reduction in erythropoietin, or EPO, which is normally stimulating red cell production. There's a reduction in iron absorption. There's a reduction in red cell production, often because of uremia. And additionally, there's a complicating matters from CKD, such as platelet dysfunction and stress ulcers, which can cause further reduced haemoglobin. Knowing this, NICE has recommended haemoglobin levels between 10 to 12 grams per deciliter, with iron status and replacement often an important component to consider. EPO replacement is also considered in some severe cases. And that's a wrap. That's a whirlwind tour of CKD and I hope you have a greater understanding of its classification and management of one of the big chronic diseases in primary care. If you've enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And please, be sure to share it amongst your friends and colleagues. It really helps the channel grow. Be sure to join in on our Facebook group where I'll leave the links below. If there's any suggestions or requests, please leave a comment below and be sure to hit the notifications button below so you don't miss any upcoming future videos. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.